Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. And I'm very happy to welcome this week, uh, author and musician, uh, Blair Tyndall to the show. Welcome Blair. Thanks for having me. You're, uh, you're very welcome. Um, and Blair has had an amazing career as both a musician and an author. And um, you and I both uh, began as freelance musicians in our careers. And um, how did you go from, from that to being, to being an author? Like what, what took you down the writing path? Uh, well, it was more of a wanting to expand my life path. I took mm -hmm. some, I was looking for a different a career to add to music that might enhance music as well. And I took some aptitude testing and it was very surprising because as a musician, you sort of uh, pigeonhole yourself from an early age. So I started playing the piano at age four. So I was always just a musician, which is a great thing to be. But um, from the age of 15 on, I was in a um, music conservatory situation. So I didn't really have any much academic background. You know, I didn't even really go to high school. My high school offered very few academics. Um, so I ended up really wanting to go to school and get a real university degree. So I, um, when I entered the aptitude training, I thought I was good at these things and bad at these things. So I was wrong on every count because <laughs> wow. I had just, as a musician, said, well, I am this, you know, from an early age, you just kind of train yourself to think that you're good at certain things and bad at certain things um, because you have to, you know, practice and be so disciplined. So um, what came up in terms of careers were, it was very surprising. I thought I was an introvert. I was at the extreme end of the extroversion scale, which I now realize is true. And I also ended up in 80 years, I ended up being one of their five highest scores for creativity, which just astonished me. I'd gone through life saying, oh, I'm not creative at all. I can't think of anything. Well, obviously I can. So uh, they suggested five different career paths. And one thing that I think is important for musicians to think about is because I was an extrovert and creative, they suggested that I um, try making music and I obviously have music abilities go into music in a different way, uh, like composing or conducting. And at the time I was 35, of course I'm 36 now, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you know, nobody does that. Marin also had just started really making her way. And, you know, I didn't, except for also the wonderful Joanne Folletta, I didn't really know of any female conductors and very few female composers. So I just thought, oh, I'm not going to go in that direction. They also suggested film director. Um, hmm. But anyway, so in that way, I ended up at Stanford. And fortunately, I was very good friends with the principal oboe in the San Francisco Symphony. So the, sec the day after I moved into the dorm at Stanford, I was uh, playing principal oboe in the San Francisco Symphony. Wow. <laughs> As a sub. I mean, I was just sub. Yeah. But, yeah. but it was wonderful. So I, I never gave up my musical life at all. I just added on to this. And yeah. their training at Stanford was just phenomenal. So yeah. and it led it led to Mozart in the jungle. It never would have happened otherwise. Yeah. Um I think before we get into that, which is your your the the, the claim to fame of you is 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 having this being this disruptor of this off I, I think you're a disruptor, right? In terms of Mozart in the jungle being <laughs> being this, this kind of uh, lightning bolt. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to comment on something you said about the fact that like music is such a, a, a laser focused discipline, right? You spend all your time just doing one thing. And we often forget that like, actually there are more things that we need to do or that we should think about exploring. And, you know, creativity is, is something that I, I deal with and, and we think about music as being a creative thing, but actually being a performer is not that creative. It's much more like being an athlete, I think. Um, in yeah. Terms of, you know, and, and so it's interesting that even though you were, you were making your living as a musician, it's like, maybe you should do something creative, right? Um, that's really <laughs> fascinating. Um, so I, I do want to get to, um, uh, so you're at Stanford, you get, you get a degree in journalism, I recall, right? Yes. And then 
you you had an assignment and you decided this could be something more and you turned it into this book called Mozart in the Jungle. Um, so can you tell, tell us a little bit about the origin and how you decided to share your, your story through that book? Absolutely. So I entered Stanford when I was uh, 39 and I was 13 years older than everybody else in the class. They'd just graduated from college. And, you know, it's funny as a blonde, blue-eyed female that they thought I was their idea of diversity, but they wanted somebody from different professions to just show people other sides of the world. And they, they did a good job with that. So I was in, in a class with uh, 10 other people and we were asked to write a magazine piece of a thousand words. And I, I just worked on it all weekend and slaved over it and made sure it was as good as I could figure out how to make it. Um, and it was about the death of the pianist and my very close friend, Samuel Sanders, the famous accompanist. He had died three weeks before. And it was just sort of about how people are so desperate for work and how they approached him in terms of his being terminally ill, which the first time it looked like he was. So everybody abandoned him. The minute he started recovering, they all came back. And I mean, that sounds very simplistic and gross, but um, it, it was the truth. So, and to condense that into a thousand words, which is kind of the size of, if you read a feature article in the New York Times or something, that's about the length of that. Um, so I read it. I was one of three people selected to read our things in class. So I read it aloud and the, the room was silent. And remember, I had just given up my job at Les Mis, which was a you know, $91,000 gig in 19, uh, when was it, 99. So I, I immediately thought, oh my God, what have I done? You know, Everybody was silent for what seemed like 10 minutes, but it was probably like two seconds, mm -hmm. you know how that goes. And finally somebody said, nobody knows about this world. You have to write a book. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm just scrabbling away to make a living in the, what they call in California, the freeway Philharmonic driving around to the, you know, San Francisco Symphony, San Jose Symphony, um, right. et cetera, Santa Rosa. And um, I felt like, you know, I would ruin my career if I did this. Well, I did briefly ruin my career because I did this, <laughs> but now it's back. You know, people, a lot of people got work, over 800 musicians got paying work through the show. Um, yeah. And it really opened people's eyes and, um, so I'm, I'm very glad I did it, uh, but it, it definitely brought me a lot closer to the audience, which I think is something that's lacking with most musicians. I mean, for most musicians, because we don't really interact, have a chance even to interact with the audience much of the time. Yeah, that's so true. And when you when you published this book, you mentioned that you you, you said you said beforehand you, you thought it would ruin your career. Um, why, why did you think that and, and what happened after the book was published? Well, I just thought, you know, we're so, it's so hard to make a living as a musician much of the time, not all of the time. And, you know, it's, as long as you're making your way successfully, it's kind of hard to reveal your life to the world because you're afraid something will change. And, um, and it, and, it, and it does, honestly, but it, for me, it changed for the better. And I think for a lot of musicians, it changed for the better as well. So, um, you know, some of the reviews I got were just absolutely brutal to read, but, you know, at least it prepared me for anything. There was one, um, the LA Times, and I didn't live here yet at the time, I live in Los Angeles now. Um, their music critic, who's actually quite a good critic, and I like his work most of the time, just absolutely ripped me to shreds in a very personal way and it was tough to read one of my friends i hadn't been in touch with for years um uh he's a conductor and a harpsichordist read it and then wrote an eight page handwritten letter to this music critic saying you just don't get our our world and what it's like for us you don't understand which i definitely appreciated yeah um, and you know, you were doing something that hadn't been done before, which was to kind of give people this backstage window into the life of a working musician and the industry itself, um, especially for freelance players, because um, the you you're you're you in the book and the character in the show are are making their living doing eight different things every week, and um, 
and you know you you mentioned that there is this like very transactional kind of relationships that develop where it's like oh you know i i noticed that when i when i came back to new york and i was more of a working for my union and i was not really freelancing and musicians just they related to me differently and it was like oh was this real or was this all based on you know transactional sort of um relationships or or um but but nobody had really done that in terms of the arts before the performing arts that i know of um to kind of just peel back the curtain and talk about what does it look like um outside the theater and outside and, and backstage and and um is do you think that accounted for some of the reaction oh yeah it was just i mean i think it was just shocking for people to realize those people you see who look like penguins on stage are actually, you know, shopping for dog biscuits in the pet store. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't realize the person who lives next door who's making the noise you don't like is actually the person you paid to go see. So right. I mean, it just, it really humanized us, I think. And I, I really loved everything about the show. I thought they did a fantastic job. Um, yeah. It's interesting also that um, your book wasn't reviewed by the literary editor. It was reviewed by the music critic, right? Um, oh, well, um, oh, that particular one. Yeah, it was mostly the music critics. Sorry, I've got to move here. Yeah. Who did that. Um, so it was reviewed by some literary people, like in the New Yorker, there was a review and such things, but it, it usually fell to the music critic. And the, the thing was, I, I really, structured the book so it would appeal to Hollywood. And I read a bunch of screenwriting books mm -hmm. to figure out how to do a three act structure. So it would at least look familiar to people. Yeah. Um, so it, it did work. It took a while to work. And the Coppola's commission, I'm sorry, they um, bought the rights to the book and kept yeah. them for years till it actually happened. Right. So I was pretty happy they, they hung out for that long. Yeah. Now, what's what's was the reaction that you got from outside the music community, from like the the literary critics? Say, was it different than the reaction from the music critics? Yes, very much so. I mean, there were very few literary critics who read it, but I think people more reacted to the writing style and also to the the content. So it was a sort of a two books in one. Yeah. I really wanted the thing that led me to the book was when I discovered through research, there had been no full-time orchestra in the United States until 1964, when I was four years old. Wow. And people think classical music is in decline, and it's not. It's never been healthier, honestly. And it was it was meant to be a book about how the funding happened. The whole thing started with the Ford Foundation system of matching grants. So you, you give $1,000, they would match it with $1,000, and that all dried up in 1987. And the book's name came from that. I was on tour with the New York Philharmonic and they sent 15 of us to play for a group of uh, the best producers of Citibank in the middle of the jungle where at the Iguazu Falls where Paraguay, Argentina and Brazil meet. And we flew on a small jet with Zubin and Meta and nobody noticed that the base trunk was behind on the tarmac when we took off. And everything was in the bass trunk, like all our music, um, all all our clothing, the bass. Wow. The <laughs> and um, so we arrived and, you know, it just, it was the saddest sight to see the general manager at the time watching the conveyor belt go around and around and, the, you know, the thing that we really needed didn't come out. So the rest, Citibank was uh, sponsoring the tour. And so we ended up, Stanley Drucker managed to, play some things from minute memory just incredibly well as he does. Yeah. And we did manage to put together this Mozart octet. Um, you know, some of us were wearing jeans and t-shirts and some of us were wearing tuxedos. So we did um, put that on. So it was Mozart in the jungle and it was a double entendre because we played Mozart in the jungle and Mozart was now in the jungle because corporate funding and the matching grants ended that year. So that's, you know, for the purposes of the TV show, everybody just has concrete jungle, but that's that's where what it was really about. And it was interesting. I, I periodically torture myself by looking at my Amazon reviews 
And somebody fairly recently wrote a review that said, oh, there's this, you know, just kind of torrid tale of being a musician. And then obviously somebody else wrote the chapters about financing and funding. I'm like, I have a Stanford journalism degree. I mean, you yeah. can do things at once. <laughs> yeah. Exclusive. That's so I, I, I just think it's really important for musicians to immerse themselves in other professions. And I was struck today I, or yesterday, uh, there's this wonderful host on XM radio, Preston Trombley, great name. Yeah. And he picks all this music from famous composers, music I've never heard before. It's just wonderful. But he had a, a piece about the planets, Holst, the planets. I had not realized Holst was really involved with astronomy. He was very interested in it. And also like Brian May the in the in Queen. Do I have that right? He yeah. has a PhD in astronomy. <laughs> So, you know, all of this, like the planets wouldn't have ever been written if he, he hadn't studied astronomy. So, you know, go out and find something you're interested in and do your scales and, and arpeggios, which I do every day still. And, uh, but don't forget to find out who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things that I think is uh, it kind of, un unfortunate and I think not real about musicians is that they think that if they're not making music every day or as a living, that they're no longer a musician. And that, that oh, well, I, I don't have three hours to practice my cello, so I'm just gonna put it in the case and never come back to it. And I'm gonna regret not being a musician versus holding on to the idea that, well, we're, we're all artists, right? We can be artists in many different ways, um, whether you're writing or whether you're playing in your case. Um, you're still the same, the same creative person. Oh, I, I very much agree. And honestly, until, you know, 1964, you had to be at least in two different fields. You just couldn't survive, maybe with the exception of, of the NBC symphony um, or symphony of the air, I guess it became. Anyway, you couldn't really survive unless you had another profession. So people did it as professional yeah. positions, but just not all the time. So it's it's you're not failing if you're doing it sometimes yeah absolutely and you raise um and people that that only know mozart in the jungle from the amazon series don't really know that your book was also talking about the health of the industry and the trends and things and i think it's fascinating that as you say like actually there haven't been that many years of having full-time orchestra oh. Um, and, and what happens, what's, I mean, we've had so many, so many things happen in that field, but what, what was the change that you were referring to with Mozart's now in the jungle, the Ford foundation is pulling their support. Um, this, there's a change, a sea change happening here, um, in the, in the way that orchestras work. Well, imagine you're an orchestra CEO or president. And I think most of the audiences don't realize how many offices are backstage at a, that make, make it possible for us to play. So imagine you're somebody, this was before her that this happened, but Deborah Borda, who was a CEO here in LA, now in New York, she's just the best in the business. She's fantastic. Um, there are many really good administrators, but imagine you had a budget of say $500,000 and all of a sudden, because the corporate funding dried up and the matching grants were no longer there, you now have a budget of a quarter million instead of a half million or, um, you know, it's just, it's been, sorry, I got that wrong there. It's been halved. So mm -hmm. a lot of scrambling going on and orchestras had these big long schedules for the year and nobody was coming. I mean, like an orchestra in a smaller community, I'm not gonna pinpoint anybody, but um, that's not like a, a large city would have might have had a 52 week season and they couldn't really support that because people weren't coming people would come for maybe a 40 week season so there are a lot of orchestras kept declaring bankruptcy and going under and until it, it just kind of i mean i'm not blaming anybody but it, it had to normalize over time so they had to reduce their seasons and the expenses a little bit um so that you know you might as well have a full haul with something really terrific that the whole community enjoys and celebrates instead of just, you know, begging for money all the time. And then likewise, we're working less. So 
you know, you, you have to go out and figure out something else to do. And so a lot of people have online and otherwise, um, you know, just started other careers. I know a lot of musician realtors, for example, <laughs> that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, it's, it's true. And um, the, the unfortunate part of that, and, and the thing that I think that some of the really best managers like Deborah Borda understand are that there is an artistic cost as well to, to that, right? Like for example, if you're going from 52 weeks to 40 weeks, the orchestra isn't playing as much together and you're gonna have a certain effect on the artistic product. Um, and I think what she's been able to do in LA and, and I think now in New York is to, is to capitalize on the artistic excellence and um, the artistic mission in, in LA, it was really about innovation and discovery. And I'm sure in New York, it's, it's, it's gonna be whatever it needs to be for New York. Um, well, Deborah, for example, Deborah, I can't remember exactly where she ran across uh, Gustavo Dudamel, but she did. And she told me um, he is a once in a century musician. And yeah. I think she's right. And and it's not just, I mean, he sort of exemplifies what I'm talking about by being well-rounded. He's, um, he's really a great communicator and he's bringing Latin American music and contemporary music into the scene. So we heard Beethoven Ninth and there were two, there was a Peruvian and a Mexican composer also on the program, really wonderful pieces I never would have heard. And I think that's really important and it brings people if they're well chosen and not what I call honk beat squeak music, I think the audience is much more receptive and they feel sort of included, especially in a place like LA that is so um, heavily uh, Latin American yeah. or Hispanic. It, it really, you know, I saw the, the, it was not an old white skinned audience. There were all kinds of people there. Yeah. So, I mean, I think her thumbprint is still on the LA Philharmonic because uh, you have to plan these things a few years in advance. But she's certainly doing it with New York. And also she's a smart business person and she um, she is getting them back into every Fisher Hall. She pushed up the renovation. It was gonna be another year, I think. So that's really impressive because they have just been, you know, vagabonds, Alice Tully Hall and the um, Carnegie Hall, just any anywhere they could find. I mean, anywhere, Carnegie Hall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, and and um, I'm sure that uh, managers like uh, or CEOs like Deborah Borda of orchestras informed some of the characters that appeared in the show. And what I was really oh yeah, well, was, she's Bernadette Peters is is Deborah. Yeah, <laughs> and um, what's cool about the show is that it it did open the the door for a lot of people to like the fact that like what. Uh, like that, that that person even exists, right? People that buy a ticket to a concert may not even think about, is there somebody running running everything backstage? And oh, I have a story about that. Yeah. So yeah. I was um, writing a story about the salaries of orchestra CEOs and conductors. And I stood under a banner for Lauren Mazel uh, before the concert. And I asked 100 people, um, do you know who the conductor of the New York Philharmonic is? And do you know the CEO was a hundred people said there's a CEO and about 95 people said, I have no idea who the conductor is <laughs> and I'm standing right under the banner with his wow. name. So, I mean, it's just, it's kind of, you know, we need to communicate better. We really do and come across as people. I mean, they do have like these great things, mixers and things backstage for young people, but I think we need to go a bit farther. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, you mentioned that idea that the audience is, is really not aware of some of these things, like, like the conductor even um, in this case. And how do you think we can tell stories better to the audience or, or communicate better? Well, we spent, I think the Met has done a pretty good job with the uh, cinema thing, the, the live performance in the cinema. So I, I went to one on Saturday. It was Hamlet. I didn't actually like the work, but anyway, it, I thought it showcased what the Met is quite well. It takes you backstage. You had, you know, the host was their current Brunhilde, 
and it just you know you were able to talk to the singers the musicians the conductor and just see them as real people and it, it wasn't one of these masterpiece theater kind of things it was you know it's just real life and this is a day in the life of people who are actually working in this opera house and you're on the other side so here take a look at this you know it's 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 just ordinary people doing what we consider ordinary things but you know it's held up on a pedestal which isn't the worst thing in the world but i think it's just so i think the thing that the coppola's did with mozart in the jungle was that it, it really made us real people to the audiences and they're much more interested um but as you said most people don't realize there's a book and all of this stuff and i i went to the set um the first time i went to the set i had a, a carton of books delivered to give to the actors so I found, you know, the extras are very clearly told to not interact with the actors. So uh, I saw Malcolm, I mean, come on, I wrote the, the thing. I went up to Malcolm McDowell, who was Alex in Clockwork Orange, and he's the stern older conductor and yeah. such a nice guy. I mean, he plays roles that are not anything like who he is. And I said, oh, I wanted to give you a, a book of Mozart in the Jungle. And he said, oh, there's a book. And I said, <laughs> I mean, how could you not know that? You're one of the three stars of the show. Anyway, so that kind of illustrates how that's another audience that doesn't interact with normally with musicians. And um, he later was really nice and like posted his picture holding the book on on social media. And it you know probably prompted some book sales. I don't know. Um, but he also said it was very funny. He, I came up to him and you know like civilians are not supposed to approach the stars. And he said, oh, what what am I tell you in? I'm like, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what department I'm in. Um, but anyway, he, my interaction with everybody, the show was just 100% a great experience. And I love watching people enjoy the show. I mean, it, it, they're, they are sort of able to appreciate music in a way that I feel like people are so intimidated by it and think it's something they can't understand or they have to know everything about it. And I'm like, just, just sit down and open your ears. That's all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Um, and you, when you, you mentioned the show and the show was actually set in the present day. So they, they kind of bought the rights to your book and the concept, but right. they, they were telling a different time period and the spirit of your book. Did you feel like they captured the spirit of, of, of what you experienced, um, even though they oh. reset it into a different time? Completely. And they, they had a whole um, research team that was, oh gosh, I forget what year it was, but there were all those labor disputes with orchestras all in one year. And so they sort of spun that into the show, which I really appreciated because, you know, somebody was really doing their homework. I mean, they, they had a huge crew. I'm, I'm credited as consultant, but you know, there were so many other people who did that work as well. Um, so I appreciated that. They, they took maybe 70 scenes directly from the show. The main storyline was not from the book. And the reason for that was they really, really wanted to cast Gael Garcia Bernal as Gustavo Dudamel, who also appeared in the show and was, was fantastically hilarious. Um, he pushed the actor who was playing him, Gael, out on stage and at the Hollywood Bowl where he conducted a concert for, I mean, the actor actually conducted, well, the concert master did, but a concert for 18,000 people. He was really nervous, but um, Dudamel pushed him out on stage on camera and said, you have to come back. We hate our conductor. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the conductor. So. Yes, I remember that scene. And, and there were some great cameos with people like Gustavo Dudamel, who is just if you're not that familiar with orchestras, he's huge in our industry. He's a real star and he's kind of transformed. Yeah. That. So um, anyway, back to my original point, yeah. they, they wanted to cast him as Dudamel and I don't think they could have, maybe they would have found another way, but it made it much easier to sell the show, I think. So we did have an HBO deal originally and then they passed on us for girls, but they cast him. So that, that whole, you know, outgoing incoming conductor storyline, that's how that happened. That was not in the book at all. That was not yeah. part, of, part of my life at all, but I, I thought it was a, a great hook. It was really, I've learned so much. I know I was a degree from UCLA in film and TV development as a result of all of this. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of going in that direction. I still work um, as a musician, 
but you know, I just found the storytelling aspect of what's happened in my life very compelling. So that's that's what I'm doing as well. That's great. And um, in terms of the the storytelling, are, are you working on any new TV shows, or working on scripts, or books, or? Yeah. So a few things. Um, so I have a wonderful boyfriend, and he is a aerial cinematographer photographer and he's a pilot as well. So we're working on a TV show about world music and dance and that's actually moving forward pretty quickly. Um, a second memoir and now we're doing, we just bought a house together, we're in Estro. So we're doing, you know how you go to the bookstore and they're, they're like little books you can buy at the, at the desk. We're putting one together for how to empty your pantry when you're moving. <laughs> so I, I Google recipes for, you know, what can you do with venison capers and ice cream and <laughs> something will always come up, believe it or not. That's great. So I, I photographed the mise en place to prepare it. And then I photographed the, the meal. Um, so we're hoping that might be a book. I, I already have a completely written book called ink to screen about how to make your life story into a Hollywood, Hollywood story uh -huh. um, that I'm trying to sell. It was originally meant to go with a, class that was being taught here but then the pandemic happened and the class didn't happen so mm -hmm. the book is still out there and I, I bought i had to buy the rights back from the guy who made the whole thing possible mm -hmm. um and then i have a, a novel idea that i'm going into uh, about life and for women in south carolina in the 20s and 30s oh fascinating and inspired that how is your process as a musician? Uh, is it the same uh, with your writing? I mean, for me, um, the music is a little easier because I know I just have to play my warm ups, and if I'm not going to do anything else that day, I can I, I can at least get through my scales and my arpeggios. That's what, what I do. <laughs> and with writing, it's like you sit down and you look at the page, and it's like empty, and you're terrified, and you don't have that same default process for me, at least, to to, to fall back on. So how do you motivate yourself as a writer, I guess? Okay, so my father wrote, um, it's a bookshelf this really wide of books. Here's one of them that was propping up my computer before. It's a leading American history textbook. Wow. And it's, it's this thick. Okay, that took 13 years. And I remember walking by his study in our house and he was sitting at a manual typewriter with a blank sheet of paper like for four hours and nothing happened. <laughs> so wow. uh, the thing is, I think you just have to, a deadline is good. Setting deadlines is very good. Just um, cause when I got the book deal, I had a, you generally have an, a year to write it. So I uh, panicked for the first month, did nothing. And then I just decided, okay, it's three hours a day and then, you know, nine to 12 and two days a week, I have to go to a matinee. I was doing a show, Manifold Mancha on Broadway. So at least that, and then if there's more, that's good. Some people do number of words and you just, my dad had a, had a great saying, which was apply ass to chair. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you just have to sit there and you don't, don't wait for inspiration. You have to do it. You know, it's a business, it's a product. You just have to do it. And it was it was really a very difficult year, but also a wonderful year because I, I went through all of this stuff. I learned learned a lot, you know, thank goodness for the um, performing arts library at Lincoln Center. They had so many, and I was friends with the main librarian there. He got me all sorts of great stuff. So you just have to devote, sit down and devote the time and realize it's not gonna be fun necessarily, but it's, you know, the worse it is, the better it is on the good side, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's like imperfect action, which is something that's hard for musicians, right? Like, it's like, we're not used to that. We want to be perfect all the time. Well, I think for composers, it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get a commission and I imagine it's, it's the same process. Like, oh my God, I have to get this thing out. And what am I doing? And what was the inspiration? Now I forget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So um, you mentioned that you played Les Mis. Um, that was a, a very long running show. I don't remember when it closed, but it was certainly going strong in 1999. Yeah. 
So I, I, I didn't quit Les Mis. I quit. Um, yeah, no, I did quit. I'm sorry. I was doing Saigon before that. So I did Saigon for six years and then switched over to Les Mis. Yeah, I don't remember when it closed, but I really have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm so surprised that people, I mean, these critics thought that I was criticizing Broadway as a career. Not at all. I mean, it's an absolutely fantastic job with great benefits. I have a, a wonderful pension because of it. I could not have afforded this condominium without it. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate I would never badmouth Broadway in any way. And, you know, it was just, I love my friends there and still am in touch with them. It, it was really a wonderful time in my life. Yeah, it's it's very, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of um, uh, faith really to, to leave a job like that because it's so secure and it's so rare. Um, and did you have any fear around, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, how did you get over that fear of, of saying, I, I'm in the secure place, but I want to, I want to leap off and into the unknown and, and, uh, with this writing career? Well, I just, um, I look, sort of looked at the, um, couple of careers of my family members, my father, who he was one of the, this is going to sound very weird, uh, pioneers of black history. Because in the 40s and 50s, it was very difficult for a you know, studious black person to go to school. Like in, uh, his whole career resulted from realizing one of the son of one of our family's hardware store employees could not go to school because there was no school that accepted high school that accepted black students. Wow. So how would he go to college and get a PhD and you know, be a professor? almost impossible, although one person did, Harvard too. Um, and I'm sure more as well. But anyway, he, he just leapt into this unlikely, unpopular at the time, because remember, the South was quite segregated at the time, yeah. career. So I took that. And also my, my mother's father, um, he was the overnight telegraph operator in Charleston, South Carolina, which, oh, oh my God, the stories. Um, he just took a leap of faith every which way and it worked out. Um, so I thought, okay, I know what this is. I could just keep doing this or maybe I can enrich my life in another way. Not, not that I didn't want to do that. I would love to still be on Broadway, but uh, it was time for me to try something new. So I, I just thought, okay, I could take a leave of absence for a year. They offered it and I thought I'm just going to quit. And then I also gave up my, you know, rent stabilized apartment as well. Yeah. That's Let's, really hard. You know what they, they call it burn the ships. Um, I forget who the explorer was, but one of these explorers of South America, they wanted to go forward. So they decided to burn the ships so wow. they couldn't go back. Yeah. That's kind of what I did. Wow. Well, it certainly paid off. And, and do you, do we think that there's going to be any more uh, Mozart in the jungle in the future? Do you see any new seasons coming up? No. So what happened with the show, why it was canceled, they, there was a fifth season all sketched out and ready to go. And um, the whole Me Too thing with Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein came around. And apparently the head of Amazon Studios was accused of something, which surprised me. He seemed like a very nice guy, but uh, who knows what happens. And he quickly resigned and fled and they got a new studio sheep and she wanted to get rid of all these little artsy niche shows and ours was the first to go. So, oh. you know, to concentrate on big budget things like, you know, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, that type of thing. So yeah. That's what happened with the show. So I don't think there's any more TV for the show. It may, I am talking to some Broadway producers, so that could happen. Oh, that would be fascinating. What, what an interesting full circle that would be, right? Yeah. No, it, it would be great. And you know, it's a movie is not out of the realm of possibility that was discussed as well. I think the Coppola's are probably, you know, onto other things at this point. So it would have to be somebody else, but yeah. there are people appropriate who might be interested. Yeah. And, and how has the world of freelancing changed from when you started in the eighties uh, until now? I mean, we still have, we still have long running Broadway shows. We still have people doing, the Freeway Philharmonics. Is there, what does the future look like for working freelance musicians, do you think? That, that's a really good question. And 
I was intrigued when I met the on-screen musicians of Mozart in the Jungle. And by the way, there was an AFM contract, I think, $300 a day. Yeah. Even if you weren't in the union, you still benefited from that. So you could have worked for a minute or, you know, 12 hours that nobody knew until you arrived at the set. But I met these musicians and all of them were, you know, at, at a very high level, you know, the level of, I don't want to seem pompous, but my level or those of my colleagues. And they were really scrambling, and but they were calm about it and had figured out how to fill in the gaps financially. And, you know, maybe one of them will, like I, I have a great patio here and during the pandemic, we gave porch concerts, my friends and I did for free. It's a public park outside. So people came and listened. And one of those people was scrambling uh, and he won possibly one of the very first jobs after the pandemic. So he's now Prince Fulbison in San Antonio. Oh, wow. um, so you never know, I, you know, if you land a pretty mid-level to the big 10, big five, big 10 type of orchestra job, you're going to be in good shape. But aside from that, you know, I think it's also very important to realize if you're doing cash dates and, and such, that's absolutely fine, but you're not getting, you need to think about your future and pension contributions, which thanks to Broadway and that wonderful Turkish Act deal, I have a fantastic pension. Yeah. But it's important, you know, you don't want to, I'm okay, I'm 62, but you don't want to be my age and wonder, you know, how am I going to pay for the next 20, 30 years? Um, so, you know, maybe get a, a side hustle going or Never heard anybody. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think one of the, the cool things about the show Mozart in the Jungle that I appreciated was the fact that they were dealing with some of these issues around like labor and management and disputes and, and you know, musicians looking at uh, how they're making their living and, and having to go on strike even to win something. Um, and, uh, and I think the younger generation is very much engaged in that social activism and I'm, I'm hoping that they will they will also focus that energy into things like what do we need from our work to make sure that we can retire or that we have what we need um and well one, one thing that always shocked me was um just how little even broadway some a few not a lot broadway musicians knew about their pension or that it, they even had one and it's really fantastic and Thankfully, you know, it's been restored to what I was hoping, expecting to receive when I retire in three and a half years, three and a half years, anyway, soon. Um, but I think a lot of people just, you know, you're scrambling so hard to be a great musician and do your work properly and also get work. It, you know, that sort of sometimes falls by the wayside. So I think it's important to really think about that. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely something that I deal with in my work. And um, you're right, especially, I would say maybe like everybody under 30 or 35 hasn't really thought about their retirement yet. Or yeah, or where, or, and where did the pension come from? And like, where, where do all these things? How do they? How do they get started? And, and how do we build on them? And, and what does it mean? And all that? Um, but you're so right. We, yeah, just for, you know, general knowledge, because I'm sure there's some people who are aspiring to play on Broadway or maybe just started or something. So with Broadway, we received this wonderful thing um, called the Turkus Award. And you can, I forget how to spell the name, but so what it means is that the city still charges sales tax on tickets and it's something like five and a half percent of the ticket price, but the city doesn't take it anymore. It goes directly into our pension fund for Broadway musicians and other Broadway employees. So that's that's been just phenomenal. I mean it's made it possible for me to do a lot of things without being scared because I know it's coming. Yeah. And that's, that's, that was transformative for those Broadway musicians. And you're right. It was, um, it, it normally what would be maybe a 10% pension contribution, which is all paid by the employer is something like 16 or 17 or even higher, maybe I think on Broadway. Well, I think the cap is somewhere just above 20%, 21 or 22. Yeah. So I, I was, kind of there in the halcyon days and it's the payout is less now, unfortunately, but yeah. the multiplier they call it, so it's, you'll get this amount of money 
you know, like $4 on every $100 in your account. So I, all of my income was at the good time. It's a little yeah. less, but you know, it's, that's why union employment is so important. Yeah. And, and people often, and, and again, what I appreciated about Mozart in the Jungle is people don't even think about musicians as having a union, right? Like they don't even think about us as workers. And so I think one of the great values of the show was the fact that it, it really did highlight the fact that musicians are working people and, yeah. um, and there were so many great characters and, and the show wasn't, I mean, the show was about the conductor and it was about Bernadette Peters as the manager and um and Haley the young musician but it was also about everybody else and that's what i appreciated was that there was like a, a great sort of um look at at the whole orchestra in a way and um in fact i love the fact that john miller was playing the, the percussionist oh my god <laughs> believe me i was dying and, so, and john, john, john yeah. miller the sort of the one of the predominant uh contractors who hire musicians on broadway He's an excellent bass player. He also lives in my the building that was featured in the book and his office is there as well in a different unit. Um, but he he's a bass player, but he played this drug dealing percussionist, which is hilarious because he doesn't, I don't think he even drinks, he doesn't go near drugs or anything, but he's got that 60s vibe. And he even, um, so he, he very earnestly took his percussion lessons and you know learned to look like he was playing. And there was one hilarious scene where he was playing, I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm sorry for my Asian friends, taiko drums. Uh -huh. um, and he was wearing one of those sort of sumo wrestler bottoms, like a diaper or something. I was there that day on the set and he was just prancing all over the neighborhood. Prancing is the wrong word, he's straight. But um, he was absolutely embracing the role with all he had in him and it was so you know i saw his name on the, on the call sheet before i went to the first show and i thought oh it couldn't be that john miller and then i arrived and it was <laughs> yeah I, 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 was, <laughs> I was floored when i saw him in the show but then i thought well that actually is who he is in real life so it totally makes sense of why they wanted to cast him yeah and so the the woman who played um played the nasty principal oboist deborah monk Love her. You see her all the time. They were married for quite a while. So I think, you know, she may, may have recommended him to the casting people. Oh, I had no idea. She's one of my favorite Broadway actresses. She's been in some great, great Broadway shows. It was wonderful. And, and it really, like all, everybody was just so warm and welcoming in the show. It wasn't like what you, everybody assumes that I had a horrible experience and it was just wonderful. It was great. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. We're not going to get a fifth season. I, I, I'm, Started rewatching it with a friend of mine because I love the show so much. Um, um, it's it's just a great, wonderful show, and I'm looking forward to l l seeing what the next adventure is for for you as an author. Well, I think I think a lot of things are about to happen, but um, yeah, I mean, in a different way. But it, that doesn't mean I'm not still a musician. I mean, people yeah, not at all stop playing, and I I never did so. Yeah, year, I could not be that bad. I played in six major orchestra, Ixom orchestras. So, yeah, <laughs> and you you are the third oboist I've had on my show. I I oh, promise well. I'm only going to have oboists on my show, but I've had a lot of oboists on. So who else was on? Um, Jack Jackie Leclerc. Do you know Jackie Leclerc? Oh sure, of course she's great. Yeah, she and I were in uh, grad school together, and um, she's one of those people that can do all of those things on the oboe that seem like they shouldn't be possible, but she does them. Uh, yeah, she's a great player, really yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And then Stephen Kaplan was on. We talked about body mapping. Um, oh, I don't know him. He's a professor of uh, oboe here at, in in the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, but oh, he's okay. he's a, a expert in body mapping, which is kind of an outgrowth of a Alexander technique. So we we talked a lot about about that which was fascinating. Oh, you might actually, I think you're pretty new in Vegas, but uh, my friend, Richard Krofchak. Yeah. Do you know him? Oh, both. I reached out to Richard because we were, we were in uh, at Florida State together years ago. I need to, I need to connect. Okay. I think yeah. I, messaged, yeah, I, I reached out on Facebook, but sometimes if you're not friends with people, they don't get the message. So you'll have to connect us. That would be great. Sure. Maybe, maybe he'll be my fourth oboist on the show. <laughs> well, you know, you can always get, for everyone's knowledge, uh, email addresses from afm.org of any member. That's right. And contact yeah. people. That's how I find people. Yeah, that's a good one. 
Well, um, I want to thank you so much for your time, uh, Blair. And and people can find you through your website, Blair Tyndall. Oh yeah. So there are two. Sorry, you I I d diverged from that conversation. Oh, so no yes, BlairTyndall.com or Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. I just uh, uh. yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also have a site for my. I have a public speaking business called FlairForGenius.com. So that has a direct email link. And Great. also my email, I'll just it's easy. It's uh, Blair at StanfordAlumni.org. So you're welcome to contact me there. Beautiful. Well, I appreciate all your time and we look forward to seeing what's next from you. And um, I'm lo looking forward to re-watching Mozart in the Jungle and rereading the, the book. Well, thanks. Yeah, occasionally I pick up the book and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> And also the um, here's this is the one I, I took on my book tour. It's been run over uh -huh. cars a couple of times because anyway, it's a long story. But the cover art is really interesting because it's it's based on um, sorry uh, Henri Rousseau's painting "The Dream" that is in MoMA in New York. That was I think painted in Tahiti. Anyway, right. so it's me on a Riverside Park bench with a bunch of naked Mozarts around me. <laughs> and it, it was uh, created by a Rolling Stone magazine artist who has many, many uh, cover art things, mostly political. So oh, I, got the, I got the actual painting that he made and it's framed. And uh, Oh, wonderful. So. <laughs> yeah, so. it is, it, it's a very eye-catching cover. And um, check out the book if you haven't yet and the series on Amazon. And uh, thank you so much, Blair. We'll have to have you back again sometime and we'll uh, see what the next adventure holds for you. Well, I look forward to the next jacket. So, <laughs> Thank you. I, I wore a really good one today. If you're listening to this, you can't see it. But uh, yeah, it comes with a motion sickness warning. So it's, uh... <laughs> Or a strobe light. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but great to have you, uh, Blair. And thank you again for your time. And we'll look forward to uh, seeing you in the next one. Thanks so much for thinking of me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we'll see you all in the next episode and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.